Hello, PyCon. Uh, my name is Vida. I'm a freelancer who specializes in difficult problems, ideally with some mathematics in them. I also like to travel because it pushes me out of comfort zone and I learn new things. And uh, I think Python is the best language in the world, like everybody here, of course. And <laughs> And speaking of challenges, this is the biggest crowd I've ever presented to. So my mom will be very proud when I tell her. <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> and today I'm here to represent Quantlane. Uh, Quantlane is a team that develops stock trading software, software that sometimes trades uh, automatically, sometimes it lets humans trade. And we also develop some of the strategies, trading strategies that run on top of this. Uh, it's a very small team. Uh, it's being run a bit like a lean startup, despite the fact that we started out as part of an investment bank. And now we are spinning off under our, under our own brand. The reason I'm here today speaking in front of you is that all our backend code is in Python 3.5 and async IO. It's quite a few systems interacting. And um, if you're interested, we've got also all these other buzzwords in our stack, NumPy, Redis, and so on, TensorFlow. Uh, this talk is going to be about two things. I'm going to tell you what a trading platform is, what's the type of software we develop, and hopefully you will see that the architecture is interesting and can be replicated in other projects as well. And secondly, I'm going to give you some tips and tools how to do asynchronous Python and how to optimize performance. And I'm really hoping you can use these things uh, in your own projects, even if you're not trading stocks. And honestly, don't try that at home by yourself because you might end up competing with us and losing money, and that would not be... I don't want that. Seriously, though, it's a, it's a very hard business. So let's talk about trading platforms. Um, do you remember I told you this would be a simple talk? Oh, that's right, I didn't say that. It's because we're going to talk about hardcore stuff like this. No, I'm just joking. It's, it's really simple, and we're going to unpack this, this horrible definition in just a few slides. So low latency for us means that when data arrives to us, usually from the stock exchanges telling us what's happening in the market, we want to process it in much less than 50 milliseconds. So that's not crazy fast. It's definitely doable in Python, but it's not like you can make horrible performance mistakes. And once we see what's happening in the market, we might want to compute some statistics, some predictions, and then we maybe react to what's going in the market. So we see uh, the stock is trending somewhere, and we want to say, OK, we're buying X shares right now. And these decisions we usually make in less than 250 milliseconds. So Pretty fast, not crazy fast, not C++ level fast. Event driven. That means that uh, the platform runs all the time. It's not like a, a web server that, that is in a request response cycle. It's a lot of code that is waiting for things to happen. It's like triggers waiting to be fired. Things that happen are first and foremost data that we get streamed from the stock exchange. That's what I mentioned before. But then also our computations and predictions that sometimes run asynchronously. Or even user input is a type of event that we're waiting on, and uh, we want to react to it somehow. So maybe a user clicks a button in, in degree, and we want to react to that. Or the stock exchange tells us, hey, somebody has just bought a 1,000 shares of, of this stock. And finally, multi-agent. That means the platform is composed of many components that often 
work separately, independently of each other. So functionality is spread uh, across a lot of modules and classes and so on, or even processes. So maybe we have a slow machine learning prediction algorithm that takes a couple hundred milliseconds to produce an output. We run it in a separate process, and our platform communicates with it over Kafka, which is a messaging broker. So this distributes the system nicely. It also distributes development efforts. So we hire a new person. They specialize in one particular area of mathematical modeling. They don't have to understand our entire platform to, in order to contribute code to it. They can run their own process and just plug into the ecosystem. Here's an example of, uh, of a very tiny little hypothetical platform where the uh, first component up there is input data processor. That's something that receives data from the stock exchange, which usually comes in incremental updates. And it just publishes it to the rest of the system. So the arrows here are not function calls. It's, uh, in our case, it's a public publish subscribe system. So the component receives the data, parses them, and then it just publishes them on. Then the next component would be a model. Uh, that's in the MVC sense. Uh, so it collects these incremental updates and, um, and creates state snapshots of what the market looked like at any particular instant of time. And then it again publishes this data to the rest of the system. Then we might have a neural network which looks at this type of input, not the incremental updates, but the snapshots, makes some classifications that we happen to interpret as predictions, and sends it on to a trading strategy, which is a piece of Python code that looks at the predictions and sometimes decides to act on them by buying or selling shares in the market. So then it tells uh, the executor, which is a component that talks to the stock exchange and transmits our commands. The beauty of this architecture is that you can grow it like a, like a graph. And to add a new component, you don't necessarily have to touch other components. It's um, all nicely distributed. The funny exception is if you have several trading strategies, that don't know about each other. They're all part of your system, but they end up competing with each other because they just see this other market participant buying and selling, and they think, um, I can be better than that. So they just try to fight each other, even though they are part of the same system. So this actually happened to us, and it was a very funny way of losing money. Um, let's move on to how to implement this type of architecture. Um, so there was a very nice talk about async I/O right before me. Um, if you saw it, it was in Czech. It was a very detailed intro. I'm not going to do any of that. So this is just a very, very concise introduction to how we see async I/O, how it helps us. So all that coroutine stuff, it makes it really easy to reason about parallel programs. So even though we have dozens of components running in the same process, um, we, we can always just focus on the one that we're coding or testing. Uh, coroutines use that await syntax to suspend themselves when they are waiting for input. And that gives a chance to the event loop to schedule other, other coroutines, so it's very very simple, at the place where you know you're waiting for data from a socket or, or a queue, you just say, um, I'm going to sleep, wake me up when there's something to do. And by default, it all runs in one thread, which is good and bad. It's good because we don't have any concurrent access problems that you get with multi-threading. Um, race conditions are possible to create in async IO, but it's a bit difficult. But if you're very good, you can achieve it. And it is bad, of course, because you only get one thread. But then there's the, the gill in Python, another great talk yesterday. Uh, so 
Yeah, this is actually a plus for us. Uh, quick show of hands, who here has used AsyncIO already? OK, that's not so bad. Cool. So I apologize to anybody who knows what AsyncIO is about. This is a very, um, very, very brief intro. But I've got some examples. So let's walk through a few components that could be written in AsyncIO, components of a multi-agent system like the one I displayed before. So um, this is an input data processor, which might just look like a, a loop that goes through data received from a socket, uh, parses the data, and publishes it on. You can see it's super simple, even though it, this is completely fake code, but the real code is maybe 10 times bigger, but it is still fairly simple. And then let's say you've got that model component that just, again, waits for data coming in from the publish subscribe system. That's the await consume uh, line. Does something with the data and publishes it in a new form. And a little more complicated component could be a user interface server to which clients connect through web sockets. So our UI clients are web applications, and they connect to the backend through web sockets. So this user interface would uh, run two loops. One of them is receiving input from the user. Uh, that's the first coroutine handle input. And the second one publishes data to users. And this one is a little bit different. We don't react to every single event that happens in our backend, but we debounce the rendering. So every 250 milliseconds, we look at what the data looks like that we want to display in the UI and then publish it. Of course, the real component would also check if anything has actually changed uh, before sending the data over the wire. But again, this is just a simple example. OK. Now, let's talk about the publish subscribe system that I mentioned a couple of times already. The situation is we have many components in the same process that um, produce data, and then many components that consume that data, and it's a many-to-many -many relationship. So the way we do this is we have a central hub routing all the messages. So publishers just, or producers of data, just send their messages to the hub, and their hub is responsible for fanning out the data to subscribers. Um, so again, a simple example, you've got two publishers there, one hub and two subscribers. And the tuples you see on the edges of the graph are, are sort of like namespaces. They identify what kind of data is being published. And the subscribers subscribe to these namespaces. So that's how they know, that's how, okay, then how they can tell what kind of data they want to receive. And notice that little star, uh, Oopsie. There's a star there. <laughs> uh, that's a wildcard. So that's a very useful thing. Uh, allows us to make very flexible configurations where a single subscriber might receive data from many publishers. Uh, some code samples. You create a hub. That's a global object that you need to pass around your process. That's unfortunately what you have to do, but it's the only one. Then you create publishers. You tell them you're going to be publishing under this namespace, and this is the hub that you will be publishing to, and then you just call publish and send data to the hub. And that's all you care about as a publisher. As a subscriber, it's very similar. You connect to a hub, subscribe to a namespace. Notice that here we're using a, a wildcard. Uh, so the publisher here publishes under some namespace. This subscribes to some anything. And then uh, a trivial example how you can consume the data from, from a queue. Uh, we also have a callback-based API, so you can say, uh, every time data arrives, call this function, please. And I'm very happy to tell you that we're open sourcing this. Even though it's a small library, you might want to, uh, you might find it useful. Um, the only thing is, it's not on GitHub yet. So, 
you'll have to be a little bit patient, but we're going to release this in November. So you can start a repository or follow us on, on Twitter. We have a new account. We have four followers right now. So you can help us make this better. <laughs> uh, so we'll announce the release on, on Twitter. OK, next tip I've got for you is tracking metrics over time in StatsD. Does anybody know StatsD? OK. Um, for those who don't know, it's a simple application server, and you send uh, measurements to it from your application code. So timings, counters, whatever you want over time. And StatsD aggregates this and stores it in a time series database for you. And this makes it very simple to track dozens of metrics from each application. Uh, here's an example how you use it in code. You create a client. And then you tell it, increment this counter or record this timing under this name. Um, it's very simple to use, and you should be doing it in pretty much any project you have. In the past, I used this with Django. Uh, so I created middleware that logged uh, response times of views or response codes. I added salary hooks that uh, logged uh, how long my tasks took or uh, how many of them were executed or how many of them failed. This is an example of an output from, from this kind of system. This is a uh, data structure that we have that transparently persists everything to Redis right after you write it to the structure. And here we're tracking how many times set item was called or del item and how many bytes of data we actually wrote to Redis. This graph front end is called Grafana, by the way. It's really great. I recommend it. And uh, again, so there's a perfectly fine StatsD client out there on PyP. Um, the only thing is, when we record thousands of data points every second, we found out that even simple UDP sends were taking some time, some unpleasantly long time. So we wrote uh, a drop-in replacement. It behaves exactly the same as the standard StatsD client, but it delegates the sending to a worker thread. So small improvement but it was a huge impact for us. And can you guess what I'm going to say next? This is coming out in November. It's not on GitHub yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, patience is a virtue. The next tip I have uh, is our own library called IO Debug. It's a very small library so far for debugging and testing async I.O. programs. And what's important about it is it's meant to be always on in production. So async I.O. does have a debug mode that tells you a lot of things about how the program is behaving and performing, but you don't want to have that on in production. So this is designed to be on. One feature we have is we enable logging of callbacks or coroutines that are taking too long to execute. So they block the event loop for a specified number of milliseconds. We log that as a warning. This is one of the things that async IO does in debug mode. But this is a much more lightweight way of doing it. Or we've got this uh, thing which slows down or speeds up time in, in the event loop. So it's like the theory of relativity, only the, the loop has a subjective time. And we use this for testing code. So we might have code that is designed to run on real-time data with some delays, like debounce processing of this for 200 milliseconds. But then we want to test that code on historical recorded data that might be spanning 24 hours or a week. And we don't want our tests to take 24 hours or a week. So we tell the event loop to speed up the time tenfold or 20 times. So that's pretty neat. And when I wrote this, I got to use physics terms like time dilation and subjective time. So that was fun. Uh, another feature of IO debug is tracking loop lags in StatsD. So by lags, we mean the delays in scheduled callbacks on the loop. So if a if a callback blocks the loop for too long, all the other callbacks that were scheduled to run get postponed a little bit. 
So we track all these timings in statsd, and the output might look a bit like this. Uh, so those are loop lags in milliseconds. And by the way, we found out that all these delays, timeouts, are not normally distributed. So we don't just track the averages, but a few quantiles to get a better picture of, of the distribution of the delays. You know the drill coming out in November. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry I keep putting out these teasers, but uh, we only decided to open source all of this recently, and we've got some work to do to disentangle this from our stack and make it universally usable. But coming soon. Another tip I have is about reinventing the wheel. Uh, there's a logging library in, this, in the standard Python library that can do a million things. It's very powerful. The price it pays for that is it's very slow. Um, we produce about 20 gigabytes of application logs every day uh, before compression. So we could really see the overhead of, of this library in our profiles. So we replace it with a much simpler library that cannot do anything. It just has no features at all. But we can't even see it on our on our profiling outputs, like the overhead is not noticeable anymore. Um, the API looks fairly similar to logging. Um, it just doesn't support things like uh, logger trees, if you're familiar with that. So a pretty standard example of how you would use this. And do I need to say any more? And I'm getting to my final point um, of today, and that is profiling production systems. So we believe that profiling is absolutely crucial for optimizing anything. Before we make something faster, we want to really know that it is slow. We don't want to optimize in hunches. So profiling is the indispensable tool in, in development. Python has a great profiler called cProfile, um, very detailed output, configurable everything, but it has a noticeable overhead because it tracks every single function call that you make in your program. So our back of the envelope estimates are about 20% slowdown if you're running uh, a program under cProfile. And finally, why I'm talking about profiling in production uh, we found that simulating real production load in testing is quite difficult because you might have many sources of data, you might have user input acting on your programs. So it's not impossible to simulate all this in testing, but it is certainly very hard. So that's why we think that it's just easier to profile real life systems. And we do that with the magic of statistical profiling. And there's a very nice tool for that called StatProf. There's quite a few, but this is the one that we particularly like. Um, so this is not a tracing profiler. It doesn't follow all your functions around your code. It just samples the stack of the main thread uh, n times per second, like 1,000 times per second. So that makes it less accurate, but very lightweight. The, the overhead of this is, <laughs> we don't know how much it is because the, we're using a profiler. We, it's, it's hard to say for us what the profiler is. How is it slowing the program down? But we just can't notice it in production systems. So that's good enough. Um, this is an example of how you use that prof. So you enable it, then you run your program for however long you want. This example just runs. Uh, JSON dump, but there could be a, a, a 20,000 line program in between there running for an hour before you stop the profiler and display the results. And you can see the output. It's not as detailed as C profile. It basically tells you the percentage of time that each of the functions spent on top of the stack. But that is very useful uh, for optimization because it really points out the the culprits that happen to be executed most frequently. 
Uh, here's a little friendly tip. Uh, there's a statproof package on PyP that is not maintained anymore, but we discovered a fork called statproof as markets that works in modern Python, by which I mean three and onwards. And finally, um, we found that running statproof is very nice and useful, but running it ad hoc as we need it, when we remember to, to profile or when we already have a problem with performance, it does work, but it's a lot of manual work. We tend to forget and we, we believe in automation. So we started thinking, could we automate the collection of the profiles? Turns out we can. We made a cron job for that. So our uh, trading platform implements an API, so you can talk to it and tell it, hey, uh, I, want, I want you to run StatPro for one minute now, and then I want you to send me the results back. And there's a cron job that executes this uh, many times a day on each of the instances of our platform, and it collects all these outputs from StatPro. So now we have a pile of uh, outputs on the, on the server. Could we maybe automate the analysis of this data? Well, turns out we can a little bit. So we made another cron job that runs at night, takes all these outputs and compiles them into a Jupyter notebook. So we've got tables with statistics ready in our Jupyter hub where you just open the notebook and you see summaries of which functions took long and on which instance. It's still very rudimentary, but at least we get the link in Slack for the, um, for the notebook, so it's, it's usable. But then we started thinking, why did we wire this in into the platform only? Because that's one of maybe 20 systems that we have developed and that we're running. Wouldn't it be nice to have profiles from all of these? And maybe there could be alerting telling us that some of these systems are getting slower and this is the function that's responsible for that. And we're, this is not done yet, but we're planning a, a much better project in this area. So we're imagining a, a package that you install in your project, you enable it in your application, you just call a single line of code telling it to, to run in the background and it will open up an API inside your program. And then you will have a log collector or a profile collector that will be asking your programs all the time, maybe well, five times an hour or something like that, asking them to, to run statproof and collect the profiles. And then we might want to store that in Elasticsearch maybe, so we have a history, and then build some sort of alerting on top of that. So we're really exciting about this, really excited about this idea. It's going to take some time to, to build, but we're going to open source it as well, so everybody can use this. Okay, um, those were my few tips for you. I could be talking here for many hours, but you wouldn't want to hear that. So just a few teasers of what we do. I'm going to quickly recap, and then we'll do some questions. So, what have we learned today? Uh, Event-driven architecture promotes decoupling, in our experience, so it's easier to work sep on separate pieces of, of the code and test it separately and, and so on. And AsyncIO makes it quite easy to develop this kind of architecture um, because of that very nice uh, async await syntax. And especially when you add a very simple publish subscribe system like we did, uh, you can have the components communicating with each other without knowing who's listening on the other end of the queue. Now, uh, about performance. We found that tracking everything in StatsD really helps us with monitoring applications and also finding out which parts are getting slow or identifying what the hell happened last, last afternoon when the platform suddenly got slower. Uh, we found that sometimes it is the correct thing to do to reinvent the wheel, such as the logging library. 
We also reinvented other things, like the enum type that's in Python 3 now. We made it like 66% faster. Or we reinvented date parsing for our specific cases, made it much faster. And finally, profiling is super important. Profiling life systems is difficult, but we are going to change that very soon. I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions now. Hmm? Yeah. What's the, what is the yearly ROI, return on investment, you have been achieving with your platform? How long has it been running? So, unfortunately, who asked this question? Okay, unfortunately, I'm not at the liberty to share any numbers, but yeah, it's successful, it works, it's profitable, and it has been running for a few years now. Next question, does your platform work solely on current market condition information, or do you also gather data from various other internet sources, for example, company announcements? Uh, we're planning to do some of this stuff, like analyzing Twitter sentiment and so on, but it's, it's all the hype right now. But that's in the future. We are still uh, a small team scaling up, so we can't do everything we would like to. So right now, we just work on current market condition information. With multiple publishers, how do you handle order of messages? So each subscriber has a, has a queue, so we do uh, retain the order uh, from hub to, to subscriber. They just end up in a queue. With multiple publishers, uh, you don't have a guaranteed order. So if two publishers publish the same message at the same time, one of them is going to make it to the hub first, but then that one will end up in the subscriber queue first. So the behavior is undefined between publisher and hub, which is something uh, we can live with. Why do you use TensorFlow? Does anybody use TensorFlow? Really? <laughs> we use it for machine learning. We've got some uh, deep neural networks that we use for predictions, and TensorFlow is a great framework for that. Yeah, why not? Uh, do you use deep recurrent models? Maybe. Can't tell. <laughs> I mean, I do know. I can't tell you. TensorFlow did not support Python 3 until recently, at least Python library. Have you had any problems running it under Py3 in production? So before uh, TensorFlow became mature, we were using a different library called Cafe which did work in Python 3, so there were no problems with that. Then we replaced it with TensorFlow once we saw that it was usable. And we haven't had any problems in production, luckily, so far. Are trading streams public? Which format and transport technology they use? Uh, so the data comes in many forms and shapes, some of it is publicly available. Usually you have to pay some money for it. But then the more you pay, the more detailed data you get. Um, so unfortunately, this is a game where if you have a lot of money, you might gain some advantage over other players. Um, I forgot what the rest of the question was. What was the rest of the question? Uh, well, some of the streams are available, but the type of streams that we use are very expensive not available in public. Oh, and formats and transports. Uh, usually each stock exchange has their own format with their own box problems. So, yeah, let's not get into that. Can I do some more? So, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. So, oh, no. if uh, you have any more questions, please uh, come ask uh, Vitya uh, personally and we'll have a break of about 10 minutes. Okay, thank you.